欢迎收看四海一家。Welcome to Four Seas One Family. Today I have a very, very special guest here, connecting to us here in Taipei, Taiwan, from Jamaica, Yamaja, and、uh, very special person because she is、um, very energetic. Maybe I'm just saying that mildly. I'm talking to Laura Chen, and I would like just welcome her coming to us live here, in Taipei. It's、uh, early in the morning here, night over there in Jamaica. So, Laura, how you doing? Say hello to everybody. Hello. Hello. Oh, that's pretty calm. That's pretty calm. You don't you don't need coffee like I do, right? You don't need coffee like I do. Ah、uh, no, I made a full pickleball this morning, and we're waiting on dinner right now. Dinner time. I guess. Hello, everyone. Hello. It's pizza night tonight over there, right? Yes. Yes. Well, um, you know, I'm from New York, and um, you know, when you you hear, you know, Jamaican music, and then you say, "Oh, this person is from Jamaica." You look at them, and they say, "Wait a minute, this person's Asian." But wait a minute, this person's really Jamaican, and they prefer that I call them Jamaican, even though they look Asian Chinese. That was kind of shocking to me. How, how do people react when you tell them I'm Jamaican? Outside of Jamaica, that reaction has been very interesting.、Uh, to be honest with you, it got to a point where, while I was in university, I just changed my accent so that people stop asking me stupid questions. The television Asian accent. I can speak almost any accent you want. How did you develop this skill? Or did, it, did, was it necess- was it necessarily a survival type of thing, a tool that you pull out? Almost. I have to be around you、uh, or the, the, the culture long enough time to absorb different words and their cadence, and then I can blend in. Okay, I picked up this ability early on in my childhood. From about six years old, I moved into a gated community that was multicultural, and it was one of the first gated communities that were built in Kingston. So the American embassy had leased a house there. The Canadian embassy. There were Puerto Ricans there. There were Irish people there. So I was picking up,、um, you know, accents from various Americans: Minnesota, Florida, New York, and then the Canadians will come. We also had a German family move in for a time. So I played with their children. And we rub off on each other. He became a language ninja. <laughs>、uh, yes, I I started mimicking almost any accent that you spoke me in, and, and I found that if I had a friend at school, and that friend had a list, that I would also pick up that list when I'm speaking to her. I think my parents noticed it. My nanny noticed it, and they're like, "Why do you do that?" <laughs> That could get you in a lot of trouble at some places, but it's still nice to be able to put on the go into chameleon mode and and able to to switch up like that. But yeah, yeah. But I was like I was like six years old, so. <laughs> well, it's still、you、really get in trouble for that when you just the manner in which I did it was not insulting. It was more like I was trying to let that person feel comfortable with me. So it was cute. I still do it to this day, not not to the extent where I put on a, a a disability. But if if I notice that you have an accent, I will change my accent to match you. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. It, it, it's. It, it can be useful in some situations. So yeah, that's that's a, that's a nice. How do you say cool toolkit kit to keep with you, to keep connected with you. Now, let's just go a little bit further here. Now, okay. You were born in Jamaica.、Uh, tell me, tell a little bit, of, a, a little bit about that, because you know I'm, I'm just curious about you. Well, what can I say?、Um, yes, I was born there in, I would say, the mid '70s,、um, at a time when the country was more diverse than it is now,、hmm. and. While I was an infant, there was a period called the Great Exodus, as 
people in my social class. Mm-hmm. The, the exodus. And that was during Manly's social revolution when people who were able to, because of financial uh, mm-hmm. privilege, to leave Jamaica, they left. And I was a member of that social class who did not leave, but could have left. So, yes, I was born in Jamaica, and I was not born to parents who were born rich either. Mm -hmm. They were, for the most part, poor growing up, but were able to make a life for themselves and to provide me with a privileged lifestyle that I cannot deny. Mm. Well, during that um, manly time, the it was a lot of it was an uprising, basically, you know, and yes, yeah, so it, it did cause a few people who were able to exit at least temporarily, and a lot of my friends from New York, uh, 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 black Jamaicans, uh, they said that yeah, things have got a little bit uptight in Jamaica, so you know we came up to New York, my home, you know, New Nueva York, you know. <laughs> And I, I was at that age. Uh, I just returned back to to the states, but I didn't really understand understand much of it until recently. I started to dig into it because, especially recently, with this situation with uh, Asian hate and um, the the incidents with you know the uh, police treatments in, in North America and stuff like that, and I started digging into it. Now, your uh, family or, or how did they get to Jamaica? Because you know this, I, I don't want to go deeper into historical because I'm a historical nerd. Uh, Chinese history. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. I, I'll, I'll take you as far as yeah. Okay. So on my father's side, the Chin, <laughs> they were there since 1854-ish, somewhere thereabout. Um, they came as indentured laborers, and then they decided to stay. And then when they stayed, they started to send for the rest of their families. Mm-hmm. Around mm, 1900, going into the 1940s, there was a period where Chinese immigration was restricted. Yes. It was almost like a ban on Chinese immigration. Now, that's happened in the United States yes. and Canada. We call that fear of dominance. It, it, history repeats itself. Yes. And it repeats. So, um, the only way you could get your relatives to come to Jamaica was to sponsor them. And they had to pass their rigorous test to be able to speak a different language, you know, read and write and so forth. But, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. So I remember being told that my grandfather, who was a very old man when he married my grandmother, which is why I never met him and why my father doesn't have much of memory of him. I suspect he had another family either in China or in Jamaica before. I don't know. Mm. But you, you ask, if you ask me, a very old man marrying a woman of childbearing age, you're telling me he didn't have any children? I don't know. That sounds highly suspicious, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. In, in a time that it was. So our birth control wasn't you know, prevalent. So um, he married a much younger woman, which is my grandmother, uh, on my father's side. And I suspect it was a way to bring them out of what was becoming communist China. Yes. And yeah, at that time. Um, because she also brought children with her that were not hers. And he claimed them. Right. And they would say to me, you see that man over there? That so-and-so? Uh, they own this bakery. You know, what their business is in Jamaica, who they are and what their history is. And they came to Jamaica because your grandmother brought them with her when she married your grandfather and she adopted them and I would say why why would she do that and she goes because they came from a very poor family and they couldn't take care of all of them and mm-hmm. they were trying to get out of China and so she claimed them as her own and your grandfather sponsored her and them and they came um, I never met my grandfather when I speak to my father I, or he's now deceased when I spoke to him you know like what was what was that your father's name oh I don't know no, no. daddy was papa you know, uh, what was his real name? Oh, I don't know. Uh, his friends called him. And then here comes a nickname. Mm-hmm. That I can't pronounce. You know, and I'm like, okay, that's not very helpful. My father also told me that my grandfather traveled extensively throughout 
Southeast Asia, having gone to Japan at some point. Wow. So these are Japanese kids running around that are my relatives, and I don't know. Um, these are things that I have been passed down to me from oral history, and it never dawned on me before the whole social media thing happened. To look into that side of history, I cannot trace the Chin family that well because, like I said, he was older when he married her. He died early on. And then my grandmother died before I, I could communicate with her in a fashion. Like, she died when I was probably three years old. Mm-hmm. And so I never really had a relationship with her. My mother's side, however, is much more recent. Um, I believe they came in the 1930s, somewhere thereabouts. Mm-hmm. And I know that my, my grandfather's side of the family was here a lot longer, and they sent for him because I asked questions like, how on earth did he end up here of all places? You would assume that when you're running away from communism, we would assume you go somewhere where people speak your language, like mm-hmm. Taiwan or Singapore. How did you end up in Jamaica of all places? Right. And in St. Thomas. What's in St. Thomas? And um, my mom would say, well, you know, we had relatives here before that. And then I meet the relatives. And they're black. Mm. Don't look anything like Chinese. <laughs> Maybe a little slanted eyes. But they don't look anything Chinese. I'm like, you're half Chinese? You sure about that? Mm-hmm. They maybe six dialects because they went to China right. to, to, to visit grandma and spent a lot of time there speaking six dialects, come back to Jamaica, speak fluent English, speak fluent Papua, black people. <laughs> so when, and I'm like, okay. And then I did the DNA test. And then you look at all these people like, okay, these people don't look anything like me. They either look Hispanic mm-hmm. right, or black. I have to scroll all the way down until I find anybody who looks like me. Mm-hmm. Seriously. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I know where I am from. I know what I look like. But nobody can tell me who I am because I'm pretty sure I know who I am. Wow. <laughs> That's it. Because, you know, the people today who, who say they are um, Hakka, you know, they ancestors come from central plains of China and and basically genetically they're uh, tracing back to the Han people, Han Chinese. But a lot of them were just traveling all over China, you know, and, and doing, you know, trade or as far as mining, carpentry, the whole thing. And the people who call themselves Hakka today, you know, they're, they're the only group of people that are not named after a location, and basically, the word Hakka means, um, um, you know, like a guest in most places or a guest family. Uh, Hakka, uh, that's in Mandarin Chinese. And when they separate over parts of China, especially mainly southern China, because it get way back, I mean, people who, who call themselves Hakka, their history goes back so far and faced a lot of trouble even within China, from the Chinese imperial government, and um, they just got up and said, well, we got to get out of here. We have to become support ourselves. And like you mentioned, you know, some of them went to um, Japan, a lot of them, places like what we call today um, Indonesia, Malaysia, and, you know, of course, Hong Kong. And, you know, there's, there's been historical recorded evidence of people who call themselves today Hakka ancestors going through quite terrible massacres and things like that, you know, and it's it's really, really hardening, but it also shows how resilient people can be, you know, people are resilient, and usually those from a um, background where they have to survive, they usually become entrepreneurial, they usually become survival experts or, in many ways, social chameleons. That's what people do to survive. And you see it across all cultures in every part of the world, whether you can it's out here in Asia, Europe, or 
any place in the world where you see uprisings, those who are on the lower end of society become, well, they have to learn, they have to rely on themselves and become chameleons to survive. So in going to Jamaica, you know, that's what they had, that's what they had to leave. They have to, they have to leave, excuse me, China because of the Civil War in, in recent history. And yes, they brought part of themselves from China. So what did they do in, in Jamaica? Marketing. And a lot more. We're going to talk a little bit more about that because the, what we call Chinese uh, Hakka, they have really intertwined with Jamaican culture in ways that I don't think any other, I would call, minority group has done, whether it's from finance, public office. We are integrated in such a way that we are considered part of the infrastructure. And you, frankly, yeah. And I, I mentioned to you earlier, but before we, we I recorded here, you know, do you call yourself just Jamaican? And and you don't separate yourself from. You said no, I'm Jamaican. Uh, that, that's from. I can't, I can't separate myself because I, my mother, and my father did not pick up the Chinese customs from their parents. Mm -hmm. So whatever they pick. Very little did they pick up. They didn't bestow it onto me. So my I, entire identity, I don't know my Chinese history. I don't know the food, the customs. Uh, there was one, um, Gatha, uh, uh, honoring your ancestors. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we never did that. I learned that from... Bye-bye. <laughs> Yeah, you don't do that. I'm like, like why, why could you do that? And then there was the moon cake. I'm like, you don't know about the moon cake and the stuff. I'm like, there was a story behind the moon cake. <laughs> you know, nothing. You don't, it's, I mean, at the very most, we went to the Chinese Benevolent Association. Mm -hmm. We celebrated um, Chinese New Year. And, you know, everyone was invited. But I thought you were Chinese. You were there. It was the party to be at. So when it comes to Chinese culture, I know it seems odd to some people looking at me from, especially from China, and go, oh, yeah, you're Chinese. I am very much aware of my descent. That is obvious. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't, I can't hide that. That is obvious. But what, what am I on the inside? What am I mentally, emotionally? I wear my flag with pride. I'm Jamaican. Wow. I got it. I'm going to have to add a little background music to that because that was really leading to a pinnacle right there, you know. Dun, 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 dun. How about, tell me a little bit more about school again. And how was it dealing with the local, during your childhood? Um, I mean, I'm sure you got picked on a lot. I mean, how did that go? <laughs> okay, so you got, I got picked on in prep school. I did not get picked on in high school. Um, people would assume that because I went to private school before high school, that that would have been a better environment. Rich kids are not that um, delicate. They are just as mean-spirited as public school kids, okay? So my first experience, um, okay, first of all, something you should know. We hired workers um, in my parents' business place. And I had a nanny, and a lot of times she would fall asleep, and I would just wander the property by myself. And then the workers would teach me the worst possible possible and all the curse words possible. So I had the worst verbal communication skills in terms of being cordial and whatever. And th the thing is that they thought this was funny to teach the baby the worst first words imaginable. So you walk up to the crib and you're like, hey, little baby. And I would just tell you to go stuff, whatever. Wow. You know, and about your bumble class and your rock. Oh. I, can I can absolutely say on your medium because it means absolutely nothing in English. Hmm. It basically means uh, the cloth that you use, like a maxi pad or a toilet paper. Yes. That's what that means. You know, so it's not really a bad word. It's just the way we use it that you think it has some connotation. I'll just give you on that one. It means absolutely nothing. It's actually a funny story. Anyway, so because of that um, 
language problem that my mom was having. It was language unbecoming of somebody who looked like me. I was rushed off to nursery school in the daytime, clear uptown in the rich people neighborhood, so I would learn English before I got to kindergarten. The proper English. <laughs> yes, the Queen's English. Oh, goodness. So kindergarten one comes around, and I go to school for the first time, and I realize for the first time that most people did not look like me. Maybe there was one or two kids in the class that looked like me. There were a few white kids in there, a lot of mixed race children, but most of them were black. Mm -hmm. So here's what happened. So I would, would go home after my first day of school. And my nanny says to me, so did you make any friends today? And I remember all of this vividly because I have very good long-term memory, bad short-term memory. And I go, yeah, I made a, a friend today, her, my first friend. Her name was Gamillo. Okay. But at the time, I thought her name was Wheel, like the wheel of a car. So I said, Wheel. And she said, no, that's not her name. Go back to school and ask her what her name is again. And I remember going back to school, what's your name again? Coming back, going, it's Wheel. She goes, no, it's not Wheel. So it took me about three days before I said, no, it was Gamil, not Wheel. Anyway, so she would ask me, so what does Gamil look like? And I would go, she's a girl. Yeah, but is she brown skin? Is she light skin? Mm -hmm. Chinese like you? And that was the first, that was my first encounter with race. Because it, it dawned on me that I didn't notice what her color was or what right. her physical feature. She was just a girl. That was my first encounter with having to notice what a person looked like. So I went back to school the next day and I actually paid attention. Went back home, told the nanny. Then I met another girl, you know, her name was Simone. And she was ethically ambiguous. So she goes, well, what does Simone look like with you? I'm like, that's a very good question because she's very light-skinned. She's got the hair of a, of, of all the dark people. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the one that curls up, that, she looks like that. But here, and it's like, that's very confusing. I have no idea what that is. And my, my help older go, oh, she's mulatto. And I go, oh. that? No, she's not mulatto. She was, eth she was literally ethnically ambiguous. That's what that was. Did I get picked on a lot? Yes absolutely got picked on a lot if you want to know why i have a fiery spirit and why i don't <laughs> let anyone talk to me in a fashion that i don't like or i snap back it's because yes i got picked on a lot in prep school and i learned to grow a thick skin i learned to fight i learned to defend myself there were many fights in schools in prep schools mostly with boys mm -hmm. um big fights picks i did not do hair pulling and all that stuff I was duking it out with the boys. So, um, <laughs> come prep school, no, nobody messed with me in prep school uh, after that. High school, nobody messed with me after that. You wow. have to stand up for yourself. After a while, nobody messes with you. What happened then when you get, you know, the teenage years start, you know, the people start building relationships and stuff like that. Did that cause you to have any type of social isolation in any way? In, in this case, of course, you, you can handle yourself. You can duke it out. But how did you cross that bridge? I mean, that can be a little bit too close there, huh? I, I, what kind of bridge are you talking about? I, I don't even recognize that there should have been a bridge. Isn't that like a normal uh, process of growing up? Um, okay. I, 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 I don't recall um an unusual childhood uh, from you know adolescence to teenage going into my 20s mm -hmm. um i was very very focused on education my education i was very ambitious i knew what i wanted to do in life and i was going to get it aggressive um there was not a lot of partying in my teenage life um, oh. i did martial arts obviously. Mm -hmm. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Stereotypical. Oh, goodness. <laughs> there was a social... I, I'm a mixed martial artist. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't... Uh, I know more than one. I, I know one more than the other. Mm -hmm. And um, so... And I'm pretty advanced. And um, so I had a social life at the martial arts club. I had a social life in sports. I did a lot of sports. I was captain of the badminton team. I was captain of the tennis team. I was on the softball team. I did swim for my school, even though I wasn't on the swimming team. 
I was called in and like, hey, we need extra people. Come. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold, hold, hold. Put the horses on here because what, what caused you to go so to grab? I mean, okay, you're being an agent, you're, you're a martial artist, you know, you, who, 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 what forced you to become like a, a, a miniature uh, Li Xiaolong Bruce Lee? I mean, what, what is this? I mean, what, what made you do this? What, what, is this? what is this hidden motive? Don't tell me it's in your, G, your, your, your DNA. Well, come on now. What, what made you do this? I am naturally athletic, and I know what I enjoy doing. I enjoy racket sports. I've been playing racket sports since I was three years old. Um, my father taught me to punch and kick from I was three years old. If, you know, I could do jump kicks. I could do spin kicks. Spinning back kicks. Four years old. <laughs> I am naturally athletic. Maybe not flexible, but naturally athletic. And I can pick up almost any sport. Uh, except for things that involve wheels on or, or blades on your feet. That, that's my only handicap if you put, like, skates on my feet, then I'm less um, skilled. <laughs> but, like, you want me to play soccer? I can play soccer. You want me to play basketball? I can play basketball. I can play netball. I can play baseball. I can do swimming. Um, you name the sport, even if, I, even if I've never played hockey, give me a few minutes, I'm game. You're bouncing off the wall here. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so between me focusing on my studies, and I believe me, I did not even study that much. I am surprised I excelled in the manner that I did because I was so busy in martial arts, tennis, badminton, swimming, softball, and all of the other stuff. I am not sure what time I had to study. I remember cramming a lot in, hurrying up, remembering the stuff, getting my points in the night before, and then forgetting about it a couple of days later. But as I realized, I have really good long-term memory, bad short-term memory. So if you ask me a couple of days after the test what the test was about, I probably can't tell you. <laughs> you know, I might not get the dates right. I might I might know what happened. I get the, the general gist of the story. Wasn't it around the same time that the American Civil War was going <laughs> on? Yeah, wasn't Napoleon fighting two battles on the front? Isn't that why that happened? You know, I can connect the dots, but I may not be able to tell you exactly what year it is or what month. Mm-hmm. You, you have to capture memory. Yeah. So, no, I didn't have a problem socializing uh, at all. I did not have time for boyfriends at all. Well, boys would be afraid of you. I don't want a, a girlfriend that's bouncing off the wall. I don't want her to bounce me off the wall. I went I went, um, I went. went out with the, with the black belt. They were fine. <laughs> well, that must have been quite adventurous, right? What do you get? You had like sparring meets on a date or what? What's this? No, no. Well, once you were outside the dojang, um, it was fair game. <laughs> fair game. Whoa. Okay, that's a wide range of, of fair game then after out of the dojo. But let's, let's back up a little bit because this is something that, that especially recently, especially in recent history, especially in the United States. And I did mention a few minutes ago about the um, why a lot of People who call themselves today Hakka had to leave China in the modern times. You know, the social democratic, or better known as communism, starting up there. And, you know, they had to find a way out. Some back in early history, back in 1854, even before that, they had to leave China because of the local, you know, civil war and stuff like that. But the People of Hakka origins in almost anywhere, but especially in Jamaica, they had a few crashes crashes in, during their development in Jamaica. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, that happened because of cultural and language barriers. That's plain and simple what it is. It's, it's also the reason why Jamaicans and Haitians don't get along. Mm-hmm. There are common history, but for some reason they can't seem to get together because they they don't have the same culture and they don't have the same language. Once you get over the language barrier, the cultural barriers, then you start to get along, and that's what happens. After you stay in a place for enough time, you start to understand each other, and then your culture becomes my culture. We absorb the culture that we are in, and then all of a sudden, it's a party in the kitchen mm-hmm. too, and in the music uh, studio. Believe it or not, we've been influential yes. in almost every aspect of Jamaican culture, and a lot of people don't know that. Mm. And when I tell them, they act like I'm making stuff up. That's so true. 
and this is the shocking thing to me when I, I, I come on everybody we know you know Peter Tosh Yellow Man you know Bob Marley we we know that everywhere when I go to to Beijing I'm I'm watching a Chinese person Han Chinese singing Chinese reggae and he's like wait a minute and I turn around I thought it was a black person but no Beijing Chinese I go to I go to Tokyo I go down to Shinjuku you know Shibuya I hear Jamaican music it's a it's a Japanese person singing and yes yeah and I have spoken <laughs> with the track at BP Records Patricia mm. Chin mm. and she tells and she tells me if, when she gets off of a cruise ship even if she's in Alaska she gets off of a cruise ship and she hears reggae music coming off of the, the ship as she's exiting she thinks oh my god look how far my work has gone you know <laughs> And that's the kind of pride we have of what we have done with Jamaican culture. We have no idea how proud we are of our contribution, even though nobody knows about it. It's not like we're out there bragging, hey, we did this, we did that. We're not bragging. It's been there. It's history. It's happened. But for when people come at me and say, you did nothing for our country, how dare you? I will tell you what I did for my country. I'll tell you what my grandfather and their father before me did. I might brag about it. But yeah. It happened. Well, I think we. I think I jumped over a little bit because just back up a little bit because what what, what you led on to is is to how connected people, Hakka Chinese are involved in music production. Okay, so um, Leslie Kong is credited um, to being. Um, one of the pioneers of reggae music. Mm. You understand music production, and I have been in the studio, and I understand music production. The producer has a lot to say in terms of creativity. And Leslie Kong um, was there when reggae music was formed. Um, Byron Lee was there. There are countless others, um, people of Jamaica and Chinese descent, mm -hmm. who were there. Um, I, the world credits um, Vincent and Patricia Chin for having promoted reggae music and, and bringing it to the world. Um, there's the the Kim brothers, um, who Kim, I think, who also had a studio called Channel One. Hmm. And they were credited to have been um, producers behind some of the beats that would lead on to what is now dance hall music. Yes. Uh, roots, roots, rock, reggae, mm. everything. Um, and then after that, of course, you know, you're going into mixed lineage, um, Jamaican Chinese. Some of them look more Chinese than others. Mm -hmm. Once you reach, once you reach half Chinese, you start to lose the look, believe me. <laughs> I get a lot of, uh, like, I want to see your family, and they've seen my family. They just don't know they're my family. And people assume that my entire family looks like this. No, my entire family does not look like this. In fact, on my mother's side of the family, I'm the only person who looks even remotely Chinese. Oh. Um, everybody is of mixed race, and some of them look like Hispanic, mm -hmm. dark, dark brown Hispanic, um, light Hispanic, or they look as if they're full African. So, yeah, it, it happens. Uh, there are plenty of uh, musicians right now who are of Chinese Jamaican descent, including Sean Paul. Sean Paul. I didn't know that. Sean, Sean Paul. Yeah, and then, of course, you know, there's that model, uh, Tyson Beckford. He's Chinese. Naomi Campbell. So many famous Hakka. I mean, the the president of Taiwan, um, Taiwan is also Hakka. Wow, the, the 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 lineage, the names of people who had family origins rooted in uh, Hakka. You know, um, Singapore, the founder of Singapore, uh, uh, Li Kuang uh, Li Kuang Yao, uh, Li Kuang Yu, I think is in, in, in mostly in English. It's it's just amazing. And why why particularly, um. The Hakka uh, Jamaicans went into production. I, 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 I've just known, I've only seen one Asian looking Jamaican band. What, what is this? What is, how did they find this sound, which we call our, our dance and stuff? I, I, 
that I really find it amazing. Do you know anything about that? Yes, I actually did a video on that. Um, it wasn't particularly um, a long story. I believe um, it was uh, Jimmy Cliff. Jimmy Cliff. Uh, yeah, had um, he, there was a an ice cream shop called Beverly's. And it's a song. Yeah, and then he approached. He needed okay. The thing about it is they needed funding. Everybody needs funding. So he approached the um, the owner of the ice cream shop to fund his music career. And he goes, I, I have this song, and I wrote a song for you. And he wrote this song for the for the gentleman, and he liked it so much that he went ahead and purchased the equipment to help this young man produce his first record. A young Bob Marley was also in that very same studio recording. That was the beginning of reggae music in Jamaica. With the times changing and the difficult, especially difficulties happening in North America with something that's very sensitive, and from me living outside of that part of the world, you know, when I read things in the newspaper that talk about Asian hate and stuff like that, I mean, how do you see it from your part of the world? And being a person who looks the way you do, is there any remedy coming? Yeah, I mean, how much how much you see that that affected you or your environment right right now? Okay, so it didn't affect me at all until I got onto the internet, because now we have all these keyboard warriors who are hiding behind profile names and fake pictures. In Jamaica, we don't have Asian hate um, per se. Okay, there might be a few people who go, oh, I don't like Asian people. That happens. It always happens. Mm -hmm. uh, prejudice is very human, you know? That was like a perfect uh, phrase from season one. <laughs> um, so I accept that as, as, uh, as humanity expressing itself as humans do. I accept it and I don't question it. It's life. I don't walk around Jamaica in fear for my life because I am of Asian descent. Mm. descent. That is, I don't, I, that is not even on my mind. I walk around in Jamaica in fear that I might get hit by a stray bullet because everybody yes. is walking around in fear of a, of a stray bullet. Not because of the color of my skin, not because of my features. When I'm in the United States, and I work a lot in the United States because I work in media, in Florida, I do not have that problem. In New York and California, I absolutely have that problem. Mm -hmm. So I have not traveled extensively to New York and Los Angeles, uh, which is where I mostly go. Um, since COVID, I, I, I have gone several times, but not in the frequency that I used to go before COVID. So I haven't experienced any hate, but for the most part, when the whole colonizer thing started on the internet, because I'm so shielded from all of that hate because of being Jamaican and, and being, you know, most of the time in Florida, being mm -hmm. so close to Jamaica, I would do Florida. Um, that was confusing. So I, I, I took a screenshot and I called my friends and I said, excuse me, um, when did China colonize Africa? Oh, I colonized Jamaica. This is confusing because I know my history and this never happened. And they go, oh, you don't know? And then, then, then they told me about uh, Chinese investments in Africa and Chinese investments in Jamaica. I'm like, yes, yeah, but that's infrastructure investment. How is this colonization? So it took me a while to wrap my mind around it. And then it took me another quite a while to figure out what was causing it. And I absolutely know what's causing it. Mm. Um, and then I'm, as, as a member of a Chinese community that they are literally defectors, so to speak. Okay. You know, um, they defected from the Chinese Communist Party. They don't want to go back to China, so we're considered traitors. I am not programmed to be sympathetic towards the Chinese government at all. But do you... But do you feel you have to separate yourself from that? Yes. But this is, oh, 
this is a very thin wall to cross. What did, I mean, from my point of view, it would be difficult for you. It is difficult. Like I said, from where I am born and raised, in my mind, I'm not programmed to be like, oh, these people look like me, so therefore I should be sympathetic to their cause. Because of that um, migration, because of we are told from grandparents on onward that we left China mm-hmm. because we were treated badly, because we were treated badly. And when we came to Jamaica, we thought, oh, this is paradise. We are not going back. We are, we are now traitors. We did not return. The Chinese government does not have our back. This is now our home. If, if shit goes down here, we can't call China for help. There was a time, there was a, yeah, there was a riot that happened in Jamaica. They could, a few little race wars have, 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 have fueled up here and there, but they're very small. And a lot of people like to blow them out of proportion. Mm-hmm. Um, I've asked my grandparents, I've asked my mom about them because people asked me to ask. One Chinese man slapped another woman who was African descent, and a race war would have erupted, and they burned down the shops in that mm. area. They said, Mom, where did they burn down the shop? Like two, three, four blocks down the road. Did they burn down your shop? No. no. What am I burning down my shop for? I mean, I mean, slap anybody? There are sensible people who know that the actions of one random individual in two communities down the road does not reflect the actions of an entire community. Jamaicans are not stupid. Why would they burn down their corner shop? Where would they eat? <laughs> the, 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 mo- the angry mob would come down the road and the community would literally stand up and protect their Chinese residents and their shop and said, move. Mm. That no, that, you're not in a business here. Move from here. And that's how I was told how that story went down. Yes, they were riots. Did it affect my family? No. That's the, that's the story I was told. I even have my mom on video saying it because the grandparents are gone. Um, that same set of Chinese people from that little town or mm-hmm. area where the riots would break out, they went down to the Chinese embassy and they said, what are you going to do? Are you going to help us? The Chinese embassy looked at them and said, what do you want us to do? You're not Chinese. Uh, you... you sound a lot more optimistic than I do. You know that? I see it every day. A child comes to Jamaica, he or she is maybe two, three years old. By the time they're six, seven, eight, they're speaking Patois and they're totally immersed in Jamaican culture. The parents, not so easily. I see it time and time again. It plays out in front of me every day. When is your book coming out? I have never met a person who has lived in Jamaica for most of their life, from childhood all the way up to adulthood, who isn't proud to be Jamaican. I have never met a person like that. I want to see your book on this. You got to write. You got to write a book on this or something. I mean, really. I am not. A, I, I am not a book writer. I'm more of a content creator <laughs> and a short content creator at that. I'm not a, you know, an activist. I don't have a cause. And so I'm sitting there thinking, what am I supposed to do with this? Because you know, I believe in you know spirituality and divine intervention. So you know, things like this happen. You know, it doesn't happen. By accident, there has to be a reason. Like the universe is sending you a message. So I, I open my, my senses and I go, okay, follow your heart, follow your gut, follow whatever, you know, go be natural. Because it, it, it also is a platform that amplifies authenticity. You can only fake it for so long, you know? And believe it or not, I was faking it for a while. I didn't show my face. I spoke with an American accent, and then one day, I forgot <laughs> on the fake American accent. One day, in the wrong account. It wasn't even my personal account. It was my business account. Oh. My mom was sitting next to me. I'm talking to somebody else. They're also a Jamaican. It, the accent slipped. Woke up the next morning. My phone was like, what? I've gone viral. An Asian woman speaks with a, a Jamaican accent. That's nothing new. <laughs> Absolutely nothing new. They even had like a commercial in America, the Skittles commercial, the Scott, the Scott Korean. It's a contradiction. I'm a Scott Korean. Like, that's not funny. It, it happens. They travel all over the world. Wherever you land, how the people speak, that's how you're going to speak. 
I know a lot of people don't realize this. My mother does not speak perfect English. She does not speak the Queen's English. I speak the Queen's English. She does not. There's different levels of patwa. There's the patwa that we speak uh, in conversation, mm -hmm. depending on what parish you come from. Oh. I am from Upper. I am from Upper St. Andrew, where the push people them live. So my patwa mixes in with English, and I, I bounce in and out of patwa and standard English um, seamlessly. There are other parishes where they don't speak like that. And sometimes you know you don't understand a word that they're saying because their cadence is different because of what of, of their of their ethnic mix was. Like you have you know some places in 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 West Milan, mm -hmm. you have to concentrate and then adjust your ears to hear what they're saying because in West Milan they had a lot of Germans. Oh, that's right. It's the best. In St. Elizabeth, they had a lot of Irish. In the North, they had Scottish. Huh? They have all this, the, these different ethnic mixes. And then those that, that, that affected the cadence of and the rhythm of how people speak. So you listen to them, you can guess what part they're from almost. Right? And you, this is so interesting because the Hakka people, their language... It's in many ways like that. Wherever they went, they picked part of the local area's language and incorporated it into, their, into theirs. That's why when people who call themselves Hakka, when they get together, like you experience in China, and communicate, they have some difficulties communicating with each other. But like you said, changes in cadence um, and, the, the, you know, the way they, they express words or the words that they put together— this is really amazing in, in many ways to me. That, yeah, that's called a hot mess, and that's why communism had to unite China. Um, which emperor is this? Is it Qin? Qin Shi Huang, right. Mandarin is now the standard language. In order for you to attain unity, the people of the nation as a whole have to speak a common language. It yes. doesn't have to be the only language that they speak. We're not, I, I don't know if they're trying to rob them of their cultural <laughs> identity. That's another story. Um, in Jamaica, our, our official language is English. And when I was in school, we were taught to speak the Queen's English when you are addressing your teachers and your professors. Mm -hmm. uh, after school, that was, was game. Uh, in class, you practice the Queen's English. Now it's the King. Here's the funny thing. Have you been to Jamaica? Uh, once, yes. Just once. Okay. There's a lot that you don't even see. The national dish, ackee and saltfish. Ackee comes from Africa. Mm. The saltfish or is European. Uh, I think the Dutch, because, you know, salted meat was a European thing. Mm -hmm. It was done primarily Dutch. The way how ackee and saltfish is cooked outside of Jamaica, if, 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 if at all, is very different from the way it's cooked in Jamaica. Okay. Because it was normally boiled. You boil the ackee, and you boil the, you boil the salt fish, and you put it together. Chinese indentured laborers came after 1854. They ended up in the same kitchen with the Africans, and they were had to eat whatever they had. And they go, wait, man, something not right here. This needs to cook over. And so it is now stir-fried. Hockenized it. <laughs> And he adds, and he adds the, 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 the extra seasoning in it. And he adds the skeleton. And everything comes back in. And that's a walk. That's a walk. And a lot of people don't realize that the national dish is also an Asian fusion dish. It's not just African. It's not just, it's not just European. It's Asian fusion. The same thing happened with jerk. Before the Asians came, they used pig's blood. Mm -hmm. Jerk seasoning. How you think the soy sauce got in there? That must be tiny, man. That's what happens. So people don't realize that. And when you go to Jamaica and you see the patty shop, whether it's juicy patty, tasty patty, there's another one called Mother's Patty, two-thirds of those, Chinese-owned. The Chang's own tasty, the Chin's own juicy. And in fact, I am told that the Chin's owned tasty patty and then sold it to the Chang. Most of the bakeries in Jamaica that sell pardo bread, buns, and bulla owned by Chinese Jamaicans. The family name is kind of strong there. It seems like, it's like the force is with you guys. You got the chance of There's a company, There's a company called Lasso, one of the biggest producers of food in Jamaica. 
That stands for lasselled. Shed. Last go. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Michael Lee Chin, richest man in Jamaica. Uh -huh. um, I think CEO of National Commercial Bank. Chinese descent again. Government? Our Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of National Security, Horace Chang, lives next door to me. Believe it or not. Also, of Chinese descent. Delroy Chuck, member of Parliament, Chinese descent. Haka. Several politicians. Yeah, all Haka. My grandmother on my mother's side, all the Cantonese. She came from Hong Kong. There is a generation that is very anti communist. Haka generation that is very anti communist. I believe my grandparents are is that generation. I have never personally been courted by the CCP. And to be honest with you, my allegiances lie completely with the Jamaican government. Um, I can also claim U.S. citizenship if that is my. I can do that. I don't claim it. Um, my allegiance is to Jamaica. And um, if I had to choose, I would always choose Jamaica. You know, um, when it comes to what's happening um, with the, what I would call U.S. propaganda, believe it or not, there has been a lot of meddling in Jamaican history mm -hmm. with, years, um, with the United States. And right now I see clear as day what's happening with, you know, the anti-Chinese movement. I am sympathetic in only where it affects my people in Jamaica. Wow. So, you know, are they trying to create a race war? I think absolutely yes, mm -hmm. they are. And that's why I'm seeing a lot of hate coming out to the United States. I checked the IP of all the people who come after me. Very few of them are actually in Jamaica. Most of them are diasporans in the mm -hmm. United States or in, or in Europe lashing out. And one of the reasons I stand up to that kind of hate is because these are people who left during the 70s or after because they were, they were running to greener pastures while my family stayed behind to keep the country afloat after the social revolution. You know, I remember a time when Goods were scarce, rice was scarce, flour was scarce, and relatives were coming out of the woodwork like, oh, we're related, so you have any rice, you have any flour you could spare? The answer is no. My parents made sure that the community was fed, that the community that we served was fed, our customers, our regular customers, Jamaicans, not a family member we didn't hear from for, 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 for weeks and months, and then all of a sudden you come out of the woodwork. That's the Jamaica I remember, that's the community, that's the household I grew up in. So I remember that time. Um, and I remember, you know, what happened after uh, Man made lost the election, Tiago won the election, and it was time to rebuild the nation and having to call in foreign investors to rebuild the Jamaican economy. The Jamaican economy was shocked and it still has not recovered from the 1970s. It was just spiral out of control and we're slowly coming back up. Could the United States or Europe have come in and do for us? Jamaicans, what the Chinese have done? Yes, they could have. Did they? No. Mm. We, got stuck, we got stuck with IMF loans. Yeah. Now, you know, there are things we can't even do in our own country because of, of these loans and the stipulations of these loans. So now we have foreigners telling us how to live our lives. The Chinese aren't doing that. You know, if we default on a payment here or there, they might take um, some prime real estate. But from what I am told, the interest rate is much lower than the IMF. And I know my people, the Jamaicans are very resourceful people, they're hardworking people. And given our level playing field, we absolutely can dominate. But the playing field was not level. It was never level um, until, well, it was more or less after independence that we became unlevel. We Jamaicans have a saying, donkey said they were on a level, you know, it, 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 and um, when the crown emancipated us and we got our independence, the United States had their way with us. Um, Manley talks about this in a documentary called Life and Death. You know, he tried to make us into a self-sufficient, economically self-sufficient nation. And the CIA brought them down. So I think that is another part of history that a lot of Jamaicans are, are very unaware of, who the enemy really is. 
You know, mm-hmm. I see people who look like they should be our allies saying anti-Jamaican things. Mm-hmm. Hiding the people. For Jamaicans to obtain prosperity, they need unity, not division. And that unity is inclusive of all Jamaicans, regardless of your ethnic background. Wow. Four C's, one family. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, you just... That, that was informative. I know you didn't want to go there, but you know, just in case you want to know how, where I stand on that one, I, I, you know, like I said, I'm a patriot, and I see it clear as day. When people come in, and they start talking about colonization. I've actually subscribed to African Network and spoken to Africans and asked them how they feel about said colonization. And I hear a different story coming out of Africa, but no, the mm-hmm. Africans want to come and tell us what the Chinese are doing, well, it, it sounds more to me like the Americans are threatened by Chinese yeah. um, investment in Africa and the Caribbean because teeth not like the teeth with long bags. That's another Jamaican saying. I'm not saying that they're thieves. It's just a saying. It's like, oh, I'm not saying that you're a donkey. <laughs> it's just a saying. Or all the time, Jamaican people, they have all kinds of things. It, it, it just simply means, you know, you could have done that if you but didn't. Somebody else did it and now you're jealous. Well, wary of the loan, you know. Am I am I scared if if we default on these loans? What would happen? Yes, absolutely. Debt trap. <laughs> um, do I do I fear um, uh, gentrification? I am definitely not afraid of gentrification at all. I don't think that history has taught us that it won't go in that way. We have seen attempts to gentrify the Jamaican population time and time again since. Before emancipation, they brought in hordes of, uh, of, of German, Scottish, Irish people, Jewish people, um, Syrian, Lebanese, Chinese, Indian. And time and time again, what you find is that the African gene is actually most dominant because we are all African. You forget that. We are all African. My ancestors came from South Africa, you know. So um, when you think about it in terms of science, right. no, the population will not get lighter. It will continue to get darker. Mm-hmm. And even now in Europe, we're seeing that your uh, Caucasian people is now becoming a dying race. Yeah. I've seen that study. So, and like I said, I, nothing upsets me. I, I, I accept life and history and the future. Who knows the history and the future? And I speak clear as day and nothing bothers me. Sound like a stoic, you know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just make sure you know where to, you know, you where to invest and, you know, don't bet on the wrong horse. Like, that's why history is important. It always repeats itself in one way or another. Human nature. You just, you just gave me a very big shaking there. Uh, but I do appreciate it. I really do appreciate it because maybe I need it because... Me being so far out here, I've, I've lost communication with many friends and family back in that part of the world. And um, I guess you give me a reason to kind of like look back. And um, I'm in no way, I'm in no way trying to talk down to you. And I just no, like that. the truth hurts. Huh? To come off like that. I'm just speaking about history the way I saw it yes. unfold in front of my eyes. You know, um, I lived through it. In the 70s, um, I was a child. I did not understand a lot of what I was seeing and hearing. And then to grow up and to read that history and to, to watch the prime minister, the former prime minister, just crying. A, a man, a patriot, who wanted nothing but the best for his people. He was, when he came back to power in the 90s, Manly was a broken man. He was not the same man who wanted economic self-sufficiency because he knew that the world, the rest of the world was against him. Is it our fault as Caribbean nationals, as West Indians, as the Caribbean community, if we were to band together like we were supposed to in CARICOM? Mm. Yes, we could probably, you know, stay it off a little bit. But Manifest Destiny means something completely different to us in yeah. and South America and Central America. It does. It, it means something completely different when you're on the receiving end. I, I've learned it on both perspectives. I went to school in the United States at the university level. So I am able to see both perspectives. And I, like I said, I can choose whichever way 
chips to fall, it is my choice. And I choose the green, gold, and black. It's, it's unfortunate that some of us do have selective amnesia. It's just so, so saddening. But, you know, you give me, you gave me a, 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 in some cases, a little slap in the face there, which caused me to wake up a little bit because I really didn't have um, an opportunity to speak to a person like you that can give, that can help share some historical references to things. And unfortunately, a lot of us are not able to look back in history and just stay at the keyboard all the time. It's not helping us. I'm going to have to let you go right now because I've been up for two days. So, but I really appreciate you spending this time with us on your pizza night. <clears throat> but um, I want to thank you again. And I'll put the links to your, um, what you produce on um, uh, um, TikTok. Is it is TikTok right now? Is that the last one I saw? Well, you're everywhere, aren't you? What, what, what's, how can people find you? Instagram. Instagram. Okay. I'll, 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 I'll edit that and I'll put it in here. And I really appreciate you giving, giving me the time to speak with you. And I hope to speak with you again. And I uh, hope we can stay in contact. With, and um, maybe when I get stateside, I'll visit you too. Because um, <laughs> the last time I was in Florida, I kind of enjoyed it. So maybe I should go back there or back to Jamaica or whatever. Thank you very much for, for joining me at Four Seas One Family. No problem. Thank you. You take care, and thank you and everyone else for joining us here at Four Seas One Family. <laughs>